Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We really appreciate your attendance. And thank you for joining us for everything you need to know about Local Law 11 and the exterior facade repair. Um, we're going to learn a lot this evening. Um, my name is Elise, and I am a vice president here at ACAM. Joining with me this evening, I have our esteemed colleague, uh, Howard Zimmerman, the principal of Howard Zimmerman Architects and Engineers. I also have Michael Rogoff, the president of ACAM, um, Matt Resnick, director of property management at ACAM, Christopher Alker, our director of building operations and compliance, who is also a registered architect, as well as Brian Forrestal, pro, or pro, sorry, project manager here at ACAM. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. So why are we here tonight? We are here to speak about something that is going to impact all of you, which is, hopefully, well, it is impacting us, Local Law 11. Um, the overall history of Local Law 11 is basically that buildings taller than six stories require their facades to be inspected and repaired every five years. Recently, the law was enhanced and approximately 12,500 buildings in New York City are subject to Local Law 11, which is most likely why you're joining us here this evening. Each of the people that are joining us will be here to help us um, to learn more about this and what we can do to prepare our buildings accordingly. Um, I'd like to introduce um, Michael Rogoff to say a few words and then we're gonna start with our presentation. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Elise, and thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Uh, we actually prepared this webinar based on feedback from a lot of our current clients, same as the webinar we did about a month ago on the Climate Mobilization Act and the energy grades. And if anyone was not able to attend that, we can certainly send you a copy of that recording. But we get a lot of questions, especially this time of year, as we're going into these five-year cycles about Local Law 11. So I just want to say thank you to the team and Howard Zimmerman. They put a really good deck together. It should flow pretty quickly. We're going to try to keep it as interesting as we can, uh, talking about brickwork. But it's, it's high level. Uh, it's a lot of good stuff. It's a lot of the lingo that you hear a lot of people use. And uh, we hope you find this informative. And if you have any questions along the way, you can enter them in the Q&A and we will definitely be uh, answering them at the end of the, the, the webinar presentation. But thank you for joining us. Thank you, Michael. All right, Matt, let's start with our types of buildings. Hi, everybody. So I'm gonna start with some uh, high level terminology and concepts to understand when you're moving into local law 11, uh, FISP as it's known now. Uh, the first thing I wanna go over is different types of building construction, building wall types, which is the focus of local law 11. First system, as you can see in this image right now, is a, is a curtain wall system. That's a system that's created by attaching the facade to the exterior portion, but not actually integrated into the actual structural, uh, structural system of the system. So it acts as a curtain as hanging over the building. Next slide, please. Uh, this next this next image you see is of a window wall system. This this is when you actually integrate a system into the structural uh, in, in between the slabs of the building into the structural aspect of the building. So you're actually building your window system or your paneling system into the actual framing in between the slabs, so that uh, creating a, a nice easy installation. So that it, the cost effectiveness for doing a system like this is very easy. Uh, but there are some uh, some downfalls to it, such as water infiltration and other items like that. But uh, it, they are pretty easily remedied uh, through the courses of doing your, your cycle work. Uh, the next one is kind of a hot topic right now for cycle nine, cavity wall systems. Cavity wall systems act with with a, a face brick or a, a, your exterior brick, your uh, the brick that you see from the street level and then backup brick, which can be made up of various types of masonry uh, units. Uh, I've seen buildings with terracotta, uh, but mostly you see uh, bricks that uh, would uh, construction that is a brick construction on the backup and they're connected using wall ties. You can actually see in this image a wall tie that's been installed from one of our projects recently. And this is gonna be a focus in the, the next cycle that's coming up. 
the final image that you see here is of a solid wall configuration. This is probably one of the stronger types of wall, uh, wall constructions that you, can, you will see in the city. As you can see, you have a header brick there at the very top that shoots back toward the courses that are running up the face of the, of the, of the wall. This acts as a nice sturdy wall structure, but it does lead to situations where you might have water penetration that could lead to issues down the road, such as bulging brick and other items like that. Moving on from the different types of buildings, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how contractors actually get to the areas where they have to do the work. So we're going to focus on the different types of scaffold that are utilized during these types of projects. So the first one you see here is of suspended scaffold. There are two main types of suspended scaffold we generally use when we see these projects are uh, either utilizing C hooks, which have been incredibly scrutinized over the last couple of years due to some failures uh, from improper installation of certain types of, of equipment. And the other type would be outriggers where you actually build an apparatus, build apparatuses on the roof to actually rig out using beams so that the chapels can be dropped over the edge of the building. This, this picture is of a pipe scaffold. Pipe scaffold, I'm sure you've seen it all over the city. This provides the most access to the building. It allows contractors to get up close to the building, especially when they're using, when they have to work with heavy stones, when they're removing terracotta or they're replacing terracotta. This, these, these types of setups really give the contractor the most sturdy foundation to do these types of removals and also uh, bring the material down and do the demolition that's necessary and the reinstallation. So this image right here is of some structural aspects of a building that we typically see when we go through projects. Uh, a lot of times you don't see these items when you first take on a project. You might see bulging brick, you might see step cracks, but a lot of times you don't know the conditions of the steel. So what you see here is a spandrel beam. A lot of times with spandrel beams, there's a little bit of corrosion on them, doesn't necessarily have to be removed, but they do need to be addressed during the course of a project because they could lead to bulging brick when you, this is when you might see things like bulging brick pushing away from the building. Uh, and also right below that, you'll also see a lentil, which is using areas where you have openings such as windows or doors so that it can support the additional weight above the opening uh, that you might when, you, when you're doing these projects. A lot of times you'll see corrosion on those also, and then you'll see you'll have an engineer or an architect call for the lentil to, to be replaced. This is an example of a parapet wall. Parapet wall is a structure that's built slightly up off the roof. It's there almost as a guardrail to help protect from falling hazards. Uh, the uh, DOB requires that they be a certain height. Uh, it's for, I believe it's 42 inches uh, is the new code requirement. They have to be at least 42 inches high. Uh, you see also in this image, there's some flashing. It's the copper piece that runs the length of the wall at the very base, at the base. This is for waterproofing purposes. It allows water to slick away from the from when it penetrates into the wall. There's also some cladding on the top right there that a lot of buildings are going with at this time to also help with additional waterproofing. Here's a basic uh, description of how bricks are laid in different types of situations. You, you have a wythe, which is the the thickness of your of your of your wall. So you have different layers. So you can have either two, three white brick walls, or you can have two white brick walls. A uh, cavity wall would be either two or three. Masonry, solid masonry is typically two or three as well. Uh, and then you have your courses. Your courses are your 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 horizontal runs. As you're building your wall up, you build courses on top of each other to build your wall to the desired height. Circling back around to cavity walls, this is another example of a wall tie. Again, this is going to be uh, a, a big factor in the next cycle that's coming up. I'm, I'm sure Howard's going to speak to this point quite thoroughly because it is something that the city is looking very, very specifically into at this point. Uh, as you can see, it really helps with the stability. Uh, these can corrode over time. There are new materials that really help ex uh, expand the life expectancy of these types of uh, materials. So. Uh, it's definitely something to, if you do have a cavity wall, it's something that you should keep on your radar moving forward through your cycles. This is an example of uh, more of different types of, uh, of mortar at different phases as it's being uh, as it being 
worked on. So you see one section on the bottom right hand corner, that's, a, that's an area where there's been some deterioration of the mortar and it's creating a situation where the stability of the brick is no longer being held together as strong as it typically would be. As you can see on the top part, you actually have a nice continuous patching of mortar that actually that looks like it's been repointed recently. And it's a good example of what your brick should look like and what your mortar should look like after it's completed. This was a recent project that we just undertook. Uh, we had a leak when we were, while we were working through a project that actually, that actually called for an AC sleeve to be replaced. This AC sleeve, this AC, this AC sleeve, sleeve actually took about three days to be replaced. But as you can see, the proper flashing was installed with the proper pitch. There also the waterproofing around the sides is also installed correctly. This is a typical type of installation. There are different types of installations, but this is a typical installation you would see in the city. That's when it's properly done. This is a weep pole. You see weep poles in walls so that water can can. Wick away, wick, weep away from the building. This we would see mostly in, in cavity walls because water is meant to get behind that face brick and hit the back of wall and run away from the building. You do see sometimes see weep holes installed in solid brick, uh, solid brick constructions, but mostly you'd see them in cavity walls. And it, if if they're improperly installed or if there's jamming, you can see water backing up, and that's why you have to keep a good eye on these types of situations so you understand where. Water Next slide, please. I'm gonna hand it over to Christopher Auker, the Director of Operations and Compliance for ACAM to help look at some red flags and conditions to be aware of as you move through the cycles. Thank you, Brian. Um, and thanks everybody for coming. I um, just wanna walk you through a couple implications um, or things I should say that you should be looking at or you will notice on your facades if there are problems, essentially just red flags uh, through, the, through the course of the life of the wall type of your buildings, um, and also things that will be on the, the Department of Buildings radar. Um, a really easy one to start with is AC unit installation brackets. So you always want to make sure that the, your AC units are properly uh, supported. Uh, on the left, you can see an image of a properly supported AC unit with the, um, with the brackets on the exterior whereas the unit on the right doesn't have those brackets and there's also rust present, uh, meaning that the unit is corroding and potentially failing. The issue here um, is about how the, how the unit is actually secured. Um, you don't necessarily have to secure it with those exterior brackets. However, if you are securing it from the interior, you wanna make sure that there's an angle that's running across the whole unit and will secure it back to the structure, not just to the window. And God forbid it's, it's uh, installed in a window such that anybody could open the window and then the unit could fall out and onto a public way. Um, it's a big, big no, no. Um, I would urge, uh, I, would, I would say that because you need access to the apartments in order to verify uh, that you have the angles on the interior, we sort of like seeing the brackets on the exterior. DOB is looking for the brackets on the exterior. Um, uh, Definitely a no-no if you're using, you know, wood blocks, bricks, telephone books, you know, you know, shims on the outside to hold your unit in place. Uh, you don't want that. And also the unit should be slightly pitched um, towards the exterior so it can drain properly. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, in keeping with uh, what Brian just mentioned regarding that AC sleeve installation, um, in the event that condensate is not evaporating, is getting into the sleeve, the sleeve is corroding, um, the rust will then sort of wash out and go wash down the brick. Seeing these rust stains in the grills and on the face of the brick is a good indication that um, water is gathering in the sleeve and or uh, rusting through the, through the sleeve. Um, what can happen is if there's failure in the sleeve and or a failure any in the flashing that's creating the detail for the sleeve, it can then get into the wall. And then you could have water infiltration into the, into the masonry, which could then start to erode the masonry and cause much bigger problems. So if you're seeing rust stains, it's not necessarily just a little bit of rust on the metal that then is getting washed down the wall. It could actually be a sign that it's a further infiltration into the wall is imminent. 
It's just a matter of time. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a this is really what your sleeve should look like. Um, there's all different types of grills that you'll see on sleeves, um, not just AC sleeves, but also grills for PTAC units, uh, package terminal air conditioning units that are fixed in place. But essentially, you know, want to not see the rust. You can see all the the brick here is clean. There's a nice flashing detail at the bottom in order to uh, with a drip edge so that the water is uh, wicked away from the facade. That's sort of the nice clean installation we want to see. Uh, next slide, thank you. Um, so this is uh, efflorescence, um, and it actually means to flower out in French. That's why it looks like flower, or to flower out like a flower. But it's not good. It's not fun like it sounds. Um, it's actually a this powdery substance that you see on the surface of a brick or natural stone. And what happens is water is somehow getting into the wall and then it's percolating out through the face of the brick because it's porous and then it's depositing like a salt substance uh, from the water onto the face of the brick. The reason that you're seeing this, uh, there's many different reasons that it could happen, but essentially the water is not getting in the wall, then running down the cavity of the wall and then out through the weeps, uh, the weeps and weep holes that uh, Brian mentioned earlier. And so the wall is not doing what it's designed to do. So this is a this is a sign that there's a problem. Uh, next slide. Uh, leaking in general, um, aside from efflorescence, aside from actually seeing water stains on the exterior building or cracking, which we'll get to, you can also see leaks on the interior of the building, leaking from the wall. Uh, this is an image from uh, from one of our one of our uh, buildings that's being addressed. Where water has gotten into the solid, the solid wall, and has um, it's infiltrating through cracks or step cracks and making its way towards the interior, and you can sort of tell it's water in these types of leaks because when it's uh, when it, when you scrape paint on a wall or or plaster, it's a much smaller flex. Uh, when it's when it's from water, it actually sort of bubbles and comes off in larger flakes. It gets very powdery. Um, so it's always a, a sure sign that water is getting into the wall and it's not finding its way out in the correct direction. So that's a, that's a real red flag. Uh, next slide. So general signs of distress. Um, this is an image of a parapet with some distress, but this can also happen just on a, a, a general masonry wall or, uh, you know, walls of other constructions as well. Uh, but the spalling or flaking off of, of material, uh, warping, um, bowing. If you see, uh, you can see there at the bottom that copper flashing is really beat up. Um, you can see the grout there is sort of projecting beyond the face of the chipped away brick and it's also cracking. All these things are signs of distress. So it means that, you know, uh, it's weathering and it's not any, it's, it's in need of repair and replacement. Otherwise, uh, it's being exposed to the element. The glaze has come off the brick. It can't, it can't stop a lot of the water. These are all problems that could lead to bigger problems with your wall if they're not addressed. Uh, next slide. Uh, delamination. Um, delamination is normally when we're talking about lintels. Um, so steel, uh, when it, if it's unprotected or if it, the paint wears off or just the age of the steel, basically it will rust um, the presence of the, you know, the iron and the oxygen and the water together, either from the rain or the moisture, will basically cause the, the metal to sort of separate into, into separate little layers little, uh, uh, from micro cracks in the steel. What will happen, though, is the weight of the masonry will actually push down from the center and literally jack up the edges of the brick and start to cause structural failure. And it takes a while for this to happen. It's not like it happens overnight. Um, but it's something needs to be addressed. If you're seeing lentils like that, they're not properly maintained, they're not properly uh, painted, or, or the steel is just old and it needs to be replaced. And it's something that could cause bigger problems when it's not, if it's not addressed in unsafe conditions in general. Uh, next slide, please. Um, fire escapes. Um, so fire escapes, um, it used to be that um, it stopped after 1968 building code, but it used to be all windows from apartments needed to have direct access onto a fire escape. 
that's no longer the case. But as you know, throughout New York City, uh, we have fire escapes everywhere. Fire escapes are all steel and they're all subject to rust. The same um, oxidization we talked about before, where if this if it's not painted with a rust resistant paint, uh, the the metal gets exposed to the elements, the oxygen, the water will cause it to rust. And not just and the problem isn't just that the you will have uh, failing steps, which makes unsafe egress, but more importantly, the anchorage to the building itself uh, will be put in danger. And the last thing you want uh, in the middle of a fire, trying to escape the fire down a fire escape is that the fire escape comes off the building. Uh, many, many firefighters have lost, lost their lives uh, as a result. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so terraces and balconies, um, like uh, fire escapes, um, similar similar situations um, in that, you know, the railings, now they need to be 42 inches high, just like the parapets, as Brian mentioned earlier. Um, but these can also rust um, and they can fail. And the, and the slabs and cells for these balconies uh, also can fail structurally. Um, so I want to make sure that they're, they're drained properly, they're, they're they're kept properly with the right type of uh, either paint or uh, coating membrane. Uh, next slide, please. Here's an example of a, a failure of a railing. This is a, this is a real project in New York City where uh, someone actually uh, died. The railing gave way. They fell, they fell to the death, unfortunately. And um, because the railing was not uh, attended to, it was not inspected properly, it was not checked for rust, the attachments weren't checked and um, this is what can happen. Um, so if you're seeing signs of distress in any way, shape or form in your railings, um, it's definitely something that need to be checked on immediately. The next slide, please. There's a perfect example of how a railing attachment to the balcony, this is an extreme case. You can see the rust is just, um, is literally eating away uh, uh, the metal, or I should say transforming it so it's no longer uh, have, maintains its structural integrity. Uh, water is getting in there and it's sort of exponential, these sorts of failures, um, the, the slab and the connection to the, to the post itself. Next slide, please. This is a very good example of what your balcony should look like. Um, you can see there's no signs of rust, uh, solid attachments, the in general, the uh, the balconies are coated either with a with a with a membrane so that they can, um, you know, concrete balconies. You know, they're porous. You don't want to be absorbing that water. You want to be gathering and draining that water um, so that it's not deteriorating the the slab itself or the attachments to that slab over time. So this is a good looking balcony. Uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, parapet conditions. There's uh, quite a few different parapet conditions you should look for. Um, this is a, a an example of a. So previously saw a slide with a metal cap. This is an example of a terracotta cap. Um, and here they've used a terracotta cap that has a, a mismatch profile in the balance of the caps on the wall. Um, the problem is is that uh, this sort of makes for a weaker joint. Um, water infiltration could get in there. This might hold up for a while, but eventually this could start to fail. So you want to have continuous profiles for these caps. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this one would seem pretty obvious, a leaning parapet, um, parapets leaning, some sort of structural failure. Um, also parapets can bow out, they can bulge. We've seen some failures recently in New York. They're highly publicized. Um, often, this can occur when water gets into the wall and is trapped and can't get out and starts to erode the wall and the weight, uh, the weight starts to cause the wall to the parapet wall to fail to settle in the wrong way. Um, often this happens, I've seen this happen a lot when the waterproofing membrane of the roof is run all the way up the wall. The roofing, roofing roofers often think that that's the right way. Uh, the higher you run the waterproofing, the better. That's not, that's not true in the slide that you saw much earlier of a good parapet. Uh, the membrane comes up, you know, eight to 12 inches and has a count piece of counter flashing and the balance of the wall is left exposed so it can breathe because you want water to get out. Uh, next slide, please. 
um, is a close-up of, of spalling of the brick and or the grout on the parapet. Spalling is basically when you're having a, uh, you're having a spall or flakes of material are broken off um, and they come off the wall. It can happen from any, other re any number of reasons, the most common um, being corrosion and weathering when we're talking about parapet walls. So that's definitely a red flag. Um, also here you can see the, an example of parapet with matching terracotta uh, caps. However, you can see cracking in the cap. Um, essentially the cap is meant to distribute the water um, on either side of the wall to the surface that isn't gonna receive water. Um, uh, often you'll have through flashing that goes across, across the wall and then the cap will go on top. But if the crack is capped, then water can now get inside. And if the, also if that flashing underneath is not in good shape, then water will just keep going and start to erode your wall and you will have a leaning wall at some point. So that's definitely a red flag. Uh, step cracking or just cracking in general. On the left, you have an example of step cracking. Step cracking, it's a sign of distress when the cracking in the wall, uh, for whatever reason that causes the cracking, whether it's settlement, water infiltration that's created settlement or, or erosion of the wall, the cracking occurs along the grout line of the masonry construction. Alternatively, to the right, you can see where it's cracking right through the masonry. Um, not necessarily stepping along the grout line. Definitely a sign of distress, uh, want to be addressed because there could be a uh, structural failure in the wall that could be very dangerous. Uh, next slide, please. Um, here's a very good example of what a par par parapet should look like. Um, as you can see, the waterproof membrane in the bottom is upturned, has a, a counter flashing just over the top. The the white powdery substance we're seeing there, I believe is actually from fresh grout on the wall, not efflorescence that we were talking about before. Um, just didn't get wiped away during the construction and then matching, matching terracotta profile caps on the wall. So very good construction here. Next slide, please. And then windows. This seem, should seem pretty obvious, but uh, cracked or uh, missing window panes. Um, you know, generally, um, you know, newer windows are uh, insulated glass units, which are double pane glass. Often in older buildings, you'll see single glazed, single glazed uh, windows where uh, they're actually divided into smaller pieces of glass rather than one large piece of glass. Um, that's because manufacturing couldn't allow for larger pieces of glass at the time. So they're literally held in place with uh, glazing stops and they're caulked all around. So they have lots of uh, they a lot of energy loss, a lot of water infiltration, thermal bridging, and that sort of thing, but all caused to the failure and or cracking and the deterioration of the window and the glass. So uh, I want to hand the hand the hand the presentation now over to uh, Howard Zimmerman. As uh, Elise mentioned, he's the founder and principal of Howard L. Zimmerman Architects and Engineers. Uh, he's a registered architect in uh, the states of New York, New Jersey, Florida, and Washington D.C. And he's a recognized AIA fellow for his exceptional work and contributions to architecture and society. Uh, take it away, Howard. Thank you, Chris. I love that tidbit about efflorescence. Um, uh, <laughs> thank you, everybody, and thank you, Team ACAM. Uh, the real reason we're here is really not to learn everything about a parapet, um, but uh, it's really about the costs that are going to be incurred in the next in this coming ninth cycle. Uh, of FISP inspections. Uh, there have been eight previous cycles over the past 40 years since 1980. And every five years, every new cycle, the building department has always ratcheted up the requirements and the costs. But I submit to you uh, that never before in the eight cycles that I have been doing this have the costs really escalated uh, the way they have now and we are here to try to explain uh, to you the whys and the good people at ACAM need to teach you so that when they have to prepare your budgets for the capital improvements of your buildings, you will have a better understanding of why the budgets have increased the way they are projecting them. So on a simplistic level, the uh, coming for the uh, ninth cycle, 
the civil penalties have been increased and the DOB has started to uh, apply violations for failure to correct the safe uh, with repair and maintenance program conditions, the swarm conditions. In the past, uh, failure to file a FISP report uh, was only a $1,000 fine. Now it's $5,000. Uh, late filing fee used to be $250 a month. Now it's $1,000 a month. Those two numbers may not seem that much individually, but $5,000 is for the one-time fine of not filing, but then on a monthly basis, you accrue $1,000 a month. So if you missed filing for a year, it's $5,000 plus $12,000 is $17,000, as opposed to previously, maybe a couple of thousand dollars. In addition, there are new fines and penalties. The failure to correct the unsafe conditions accrue at $1,000 a month um, after the first additional penalties are based on the amount of, and then there's an additional fine based on the um, length of a sidewalk shed that you have surrounding your building. So if you don't correct your unsafe conditions, um, the, the fines will accrue. And then also in the report, you're supposed to say these conditions, these unsafe conditions will be fixed within a 12 month period. Well, if that 12 month period comes and goes and you take 14 months, there's two months extra, you will be fined $2,000 for not meeting your deadline. And failure to correct the swarm conditions is $2,000. This isn't new, but again, in the building department's heightened uh, due diligence, um, it is now being stringently enforced as a, a, a fine, whereas before it was kind of overlooked. Next, please. Again, the difference between the eighth and ninth cycle, there are more in-depth inspections. There need to be probes. Probes are basically biopsies into the wall, cutting a uh, one foot by one foot uh, square hole so that we could stick our hands, stick a camera in there and inspect the condition um, of the um, cavity wall. We are looking for the existence of wall ties, we are looking for the spacing of wall ties, and we are looking for the condition of wall ties. Um, wall ties, as we saw in the uh, earlier slide that Brian presented where he mentioned cavity walls and said it was a hot topic, boy, was that an understatement because that is the um, uh, focus of the ninth cycle. Whereas in the eighth cycle, the building department literally went after terracotta. In the ninth cycle, they are going after uh, cavity wall construction. Um, uh, not to get you bored with um, details, but when cavity wall construction came in the uh, 50s, you had to have wall ties every four feet. Uh, later on, they reduced it down to every two feet. Um, wall ties used to be made of galvanized uh, material that used to rust and fail and therefore defeated the purpose that they were uh, designed to uh, hold the walls together. Um, and all of these uh, uh, glazed brick or non-glazed brick buildings that you have read about where panels of brick have fallen off and usually down on the street are um, a result of uh, wall tie failure. So that's why the building department is requiring uh, uh, um, probes to be done starting the ninth cycle and every odd cycle afterwards. And again, it's to um, assess, to confirm that there are wall ties, um, confirm the presence, the spacing of them and the condition of them. Uh, next. We are in fact having discussion with the building department, by the way, because probes cutting out a one foot by one foot 
section of wall, every number of feet is an expensive proposition. We have been in discussion with the building department about alternate means. Uh, there are metal detecting devices, you know, like stud finders to uh, be very simplistic about it, but they, they only tell you the presence of metal. They don't tell you the condition. Um, uh, there are boroscopes where you could drill a hole and as opposed to removing a square foot of brick, you could just drill a hole, um, but that has some drawbacks also, but we are pursuing alternate means with the building department, but right now probes are a required uh, method of um, inspection. Um, also, um, exceptions to this new more in-depth uh, inspection requirement are if your building has in the last 10 years done a substantial exterior restoration, uh, you can make a case to the building department that you uh, have done this, have repaired this, and with submission of proper documentation and photographs, uh, if you could prove to the building department that uh, you have proof that um, of these inspections and prior restoration projects, you will be absolved of the more in-depth inspections. You still will have to repair your building, but you will be exempted from the more in-depth inspection. And also buildings under 10 years old, new buildings that have a, T a TCO, a temporary certificate of occupancy, um, uh, that is uh, younger than 10 years old, again, with proper documentation, photographs, and uh, show, me docu show me type of documents that absolutely um, convinces the building department, you will be absolved of only the more in-depth requirement of um, cavity wall inspection. Next. So with more inspections, um, we are required in, in pre prior cycles, you had to inspect uh, a, a every primary facade that was upon the pu uh, public uh, walkway. Uh, you had to do at least one uh, scaffold inspection. They have now required it every 60 feet. So if you have a building 240 feet long that fa faces an avenue, you previously could have gotten away with one scaffold drop. Now you need, you know, four scaffold drops. Doesn't sound like much, but each scaffold drop could be, you know, an additional five to ten thousand um, dollars. So the 60 feet is a um, uh, a, a new thing. Um, in the lower left-hand corner, um, you'll see somebody rappelling off the building. That is, uh, we, in our office, we have an anticipation of this um, developed a program, as well as some of uh, the other engineering firms in New York. Um, this is called indus industrial rope access. Why, don't ask me, but it's really uh, rappelling down the uh, outsides of buildings, basically with mountain climbing gear. And this is a more uh, ad adaptable, quicker, easier, and uh, cheaper <coughs> method of inspection of the facade. It's not foolproof. It doesn't replace um, uh, scaffolding, but it does help and facilitate and has its appropriate use as a cost-saving measure. Next, please. Um, just to give you a frame of reference, uh, this is the Flatiron Building. Um, we needed to inspect the building. Uh, it's, I was going to say 360 degrees, but it's really a triangular building. Um, but because of the nature and the difficulty with a penthouse that nobody sees, um, it's very difficult to rig, and it was going to cost $160,000 with conventional rigging and take 10 weeks to get a permit and actually get rigged on the building. We were able to do this <clears throat> in four days with four people at a cost of uh, $25,000, thus saving the owner about $130,000. So this was a win-win for everybody. 
back to the difference between the eighth and ninth cycle, more qualified inspectors are required. <clears throat> uh, the requirements for each inspector have been ratcheted up. It has to be a professional with a license and seven years relevant experience. They can't just be an architect or an engineer. They have to have a proper experience in uh, facade inspection. Other inspectors are delegated by the QE, the Qualified Exterior Wall Inspector. Uh, there are three years with relevant experience with an architectural or engineering degree, and other requirements are five years relevant experience without an architectural or engineering degree. All these things, the fines, the additional inspection requirements, the higher qualifications, all are serving to ratchet up the costs of doing these inspections and um, doing the work that is required. Next. So there's um, more transparency also. Um, uh, the owners, uh, all building owners must post a FISP condition certificate in their lobbies in a similar manner, manner that elevator certificates are posted or um, the way restaurants now are required to, uh, you know, have an A or B or C rating or with the energy certificates uh, that you're required to have. All of this is um, uh, towards a more transparent um, uh, um, awareness to the public about what the conditions are of your building, both from an energy point of view in the sense of the energy laws and a um, transparency in the FISP uh, condition of your building facade so that it will alert all occupants as to the condition of your building. Um, the DOB will perform inspections for extension requests. Um, they do require now that there is photo verification of close-up inspectors um, that to actually show us on the facade actually touching the brick or the stone or the cornice or the balcony they want photographs to show um, that people are actually up close and personal on the facade because uh, years past in certain situations, people may have lied, people may have um, done it from uh, the ground and the building department really requires a hands-on inspection and they want better verification. Next. Um, so these are just a more follow through. There's a recommended time frame to resolve all the unsafe conditions and they have to be included in the FISP report. Uh, you cannot extend anything beyond five years. Um, a subsequent report is now required to change the, re the FISP repair lines, uh, deadlines. In the old days, you used to file an extension and you could extend uh, the repair deadline. Now you have to uh, file a what's called a subsequent report. All of this is additional time, additional required filing, additional scrutiny um, that the building department is mandating um, to really tighten up the screws in terms of the reporting and in terms of the fixing. Next. Um, there's much more additional documentation required in the lower uh, left-hand corner. Uh, it, the pink thing with the ABC is uh, um, a required um, plot plan, and it shows um, uh, where the locations of the swamp and unsafe conditions are shown. We never had to show it before. Now they want documentation in plan and in photograph as to where the conditions are. Uh, if the building isn't going to meet the swamp repair deadline, a subsequent report is required to change the repair date. If you don't do that, then the fi then fines uh, are implemented because you haven't met your deadlines. 
and unsafe reports must describe the type and location of the protection you are recommending, whether it's a sidewalk shed, whether it's netting or catch-alls, the building departments wants us to be more specific about everything. Next. Um, what used to pass for, uh, we would, um, you know, just give a, let's just say a more vague description to the building department. Um, now they want uh, very serious documentation in their reporting and they actually review and examine and will call our office or other offices of inspectors to say, on page 23, you show this photograph, but on four, page 43, you show in your drawing and there's a discrepancy. Please remedy or explain. Uh, you know, in the first four, uh, you know, in the first 20 years of reporting, they barely, the building department barely read a report. Now they are you know, matching page 23 to a photograph on page 46. So they, this is really on their radar and they really want the professionals to um, uh, take a, a much closer look at the repairs uh, to the building and they want the building owners to really ratchet up the repair program. Next. And again, unsafe buildings must now note the type and location uh, protection recommended. We never really had to do this before. The owner has 90 days to repair unsafe conditions. In the old days uh, or before the ninth cycle, all you had to do was put a shed up if you had unsafe conditions and there was no 90 day requirement. And now you have to show the unsafe conditions and identify a repair date for the building department. So there's very little area for running for cover. They are trying to eliminate as much gray area that previously existed in prior cycles. Next. This is uh, just a cheat sheet. Uh, we call it a cheat sheet, but it's uh, a very serious document actually, uh, just showing you when the A windows are, the B windows, uh, C windows, and all their sub cycles um, for uh, filing your various building department. Um, all your, the, your filing windows are, pre every building in New York has a block and lot number. Uh, so the, the uh, filing windows are based on what your block number is. In, in A, if your block ends in a four, five, six, or nine, this is, you know, your window extends um, from February 2020 to 2022, and so on. The B window and the C window, it's all predicated on your block number. Next. And now I will turn it back over to, um, I think it is Matt. Oh, that's right. So uh, thank you, Howard. And um, if you haven't been scared enough about you know, all these changes in costs, um, you know, we wanna show you what and how to create a, a proper budget. So you know, in terms of construction, you usually only hear about the, the physical construction costs, but on a project like this and, and many others, uh, there are actually a lot of other uh, soft costs included. So your engineer um, will not only design and bid out the project, but they have to um, oversee the construction, make sure it's done in a satisfactory manner, sign off on pay recs. Um, obviously you have the contractor. We like to carry at the very beginning a 15% contingency for the contractor. There are uh, DOB filing fees. Uh, typically, you'll have to do asbestos testing before you can start. Uh, special inspectors are needed on many types of these projects. Expediting fees. Um, most often, we forget about the legal fees, not just for um, the contract itself, but perhaps access agreements with neighbors, even residents within your own um, apartments. And then, generally speaking, early on, 
will either carry an other contingency or um, a soft cost contingency as well. And so with all these costs, um, we like to model out um, for our clients what the cash flow output is going to look like. And in this instance, in this example, you'll see all of the um, facade or balcony related costs, but also we know there are other additional projects going on. So we'll model out your entire cash flow. And um, if you don't mind clicking the next slide, please, you'll see that we start with your beginning reserve balance. We'll factor in any additional income that might come in via an assessment. Um, and then we model out on a line by line item uh, month by month as well, what your ending reserve balance will be based on all the costs, not just for our project that or your facade project, but all your other projects uh, within the building. So just because you have to do this project um, doesn't mean you can't strategize and do it in a way that benefits um, your building and residents. Um, the most. So one example of this would be um, starting or sequencing work in a manner that will allow perhaps um, a portion of your roof to open, a courtyard to be accessed earlier on, um, and to try and provide amenities that your residents um, love in a, in a faster manner. Um, others include, um, for example, right now, if you are in the A cycle, that Howard uh, mentioned for nine cycle inspection report filings. Perhaps we can um, piggyback off of eighth cycle work, have all the rigs on your building in place and use those rigs at a very minimal cost to do your ninth cycle uh, report. So at this time, uh, for those in the eighth cycle, we are strategizing with our um, boards and clients to do nine cycle um, filings is safe with your eighth cycle work. And that will actually allow um, you the confidence to know that um, you won't really have to do any type of facade work for an additional uh, five years. So once we do come up with the strategy and we've worked through all these options and we understand where we wanna start and, and how long it's gonna take, we need to communicate this to your residents. So we like to use um, a chart like you see here we will actually break down um, the line. So every draw, every, excuse me, area of work on a facade project is giving a letter and a number uh, assigned to it. So N1 would stand for North one in, in this case. And so we like to identify all the apartments that'll be affected by work on that N1 drop. Um, this way we can inform residents, particularly now with COVID as everyone's learning and working from home, um, so that you can make, or they can make um, the best accommodations, you know, for, for a difficult project that's, that's going to occur, you know, out, outside their window. So, you know, we strongly believe in, you know, communicating, you know, weekly to residents uh, and or bi-weekly, depending on the amount of work, obviously the same to board so that everyone has a good idea of what's going on and when it's going to happen uh, near them. So, um, you know, at this time, if anyone has any questions, please um, type them into the chat and uh, we'll be happy to answer them. All right, so we've already received a few questions. Thank you everyone for your wonderful presentation, first of all. Um, and now I'm gonna start with the first question, which is how long can scaffolding stay erected and what are the requirements and or restrictions for scaffolding? You want, I'll sure. take it. Okay. Um, so it, it's predicated, uh, obviously, if you have, if you do a facade inspection and you it's determined that you have unsafe conditions, uh, you must put up a bridge immediately. Uh, within 24, 48 hours of finding out that you have unsafe conditions, you have to put it up. If you have swarm conditions, uh, you have time for your architects or engineers to plan out a capital improvement program and the shed would go up at the time uh, that the contractor has been hired and work is about to commence and the shed would go up uh, in what's called the mobilization period, the beginning stages of the uh, capital improvement or restoration phase. Okay, thank you. All right, um, how far out should we start planning for the ninth cycle inspections? 
This, this could be in anyone. <laughs> sure. So, so that's really predicated uh, based on your block and lot number. And um, you're only actually allowed to do inspections during a, a certain window. Um, and if you're interested in what that window is, you know, please reach out to us, you know, on the on the side, and we'll be happy to let you know what your individual window uh, is. Right. How do you ensure that only AC brackets are not anchored into the window frame and that they're sorry, how how do you ensure that only AC brackets that are not anchored into the window frame are used? Sometimes they see brackets screwed into the window frame and that can cause water infiltration. Um, I could I can answer that, Elise. Um, I, I mean, essentially, you know, we would advise we would advise our boards and clients to have um, uh, you would have a policy in place with your building which stipulates how those ACs need to be installed. Um, and often and often our uh, staff can help uh, uh, install those uh, with, you know, protocols that are in place. Um, you can't really, you know, we can't necessarily police. It, it's very difficult to police um, every single AC unit, obviously, if they're installed by the tenants themselves. But I would say if you're seeing those brackets at the exterior, if you're not, uh, then then chances are they're in, you know, it's in better shape than not. But if you don't see those brackets, I think, you know, you need to survey that apartment and make sure they're installed correctly. Um, in a number of our buildings, we've actually deployed uh, architects to prepare surveys for the facades of our buildings, noting uh, AC units that they may consider to be potentially unsafe. And then they're verified with the resident manager and or the staff to determine how those units are secured. And in the instances where they're not secured properly back to the structure, um, then the, they are remedied immediately uh, because we definitely don't want one of those units falling into a public way. Great, thank you. Um, so because the cavity wall is so important um, during the cycle, can you explain again in more in detail what a cavity wall is? Sure. Um, in, in the old days, uh, pre-war buildings say it was built on solid mass uh, brick. Um, we saw in a previous slide where they just built three, four, five layers of whites of brick. As buildings wanted to get uh, taller in the 50s, they wanted a cheaper, more cost effective and a quicker method of construction. So uh, they came up with uh, this method where they put um, backup lock on the floor slab. There was an air gap and the brick veneer was literally a winds, uh, a weather screen um, that uh, protected uh, uh, the inner wall from the elements. But in order to hold the outer wall, the brick wall to the backup block, there had to be uh, some mechanism and that was a wall tie. And those wall ties, as I discussed, were originally only four feet on center then they became two feet on center. They were originally made of galvanized metal that rotted. Now we use stainless steel, but literally the wall tie prevents the brick from leaning forward and failing. Um, so it holds the two walls together in parallel. But if the wall ties fail, then the brick slips out. Thank you, Howard. All right, um, what are your thoughts on third party inspections? Um, they are re a requirement. Um, they are um, kind of an oversight, a group of independent people that have to verify that what we put down in drawings and you contracted with the contractor to build and the contractor is required to build, there is a third party oversight that comes out on site to make sure that what was in the drawings and paid for to be built was actually built. Um, it's kind of a triple check. All right, thank you. Um, do city owned buildings have to carry out cycle eight and nine inspections work themselves? So, um, as a very cynical New Yorker, when the um, uh, uh, Local Law 10 came into being in 1980, um, the, building, the city was in terrible condition. 
um, and uh, things were falling off and a woman uh, was killed, Grace Gold was killed near Barnard College. The city was looking at Chicago as a model for instituting a law, but at that time, for those of you that remember, the, the city of New York was the largest landlord of buildings that were six stories and less. So the New York City, the, build, the, the, the city of New York said, we're gonna make everybody who owns a building above six stories re, be required to inspect and report on the condition of their facades, but six stories and less, we're not going to uh, require that. But the truth of the matter is, and we've talked to the building department about this, in the building code, <clears throat> It is required that all buildings be maintained in a safe condition. The only difference is buildings above six stories are required to file a report. Buildings below six stories are not required to file a report, but theoretically they are still required to maintain them and keep them in a safe manner. So it has nothing to do with city ownership really anymore. All right, thank you. Um, what does FISP stand for? Um, I'm having a senior moment. Facade inspection. Uh, safety program. Uh, facade safety inspection. Safety program. Right, thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, are there efficiencies to complete other work such as lintel flashing repairs, construction defects that are causing interior leaks during FISP inspection? and or repairs that require drops and sheds? So uh, I would say absolutely. Um, one of the first things we like to do when a FIST uh, project is underway is to survey the building to make sure that we know of any um, known or even possible leaks from the exterior. Um, there's a lot of mobilization costs included um, when a contractor comes in site to, to do your facade work, so absolutely. Great. I just want to point out to Matt's uh, point, it is essential that if you're contemplating an exterior uh, program that you have to do a leak investigation. The worst thing that could happen to anyone, uh, management, engineering, or the building, that at the end of the project, and we're all high-fiving each other, what a beautiful job we all did, um, and you're at an annual meeting, and some little old lady stands up and says, you spent all this money on the outside of the building for you know however much money you spent. And I had a leak before we started and I still have a leak after. So I, I, it is very important that you do a leak survey at the inception. All right, good advice. Um, does this apply to all building facade types, not just masonry? all buildings are included in the FIS Pro. Any building of any material over six stories is required to file an inspection report. To add to that a little bit, some of the things they might look for on facades with glass or panels would be sealant, cracked glass, uh, mullions that might be coming loose and become falling hazards. So there's definitely things that are on these curtain wall systems and window wall systems that could become falling hazards that could be very, uh, that would be addressed during your FISP cycle. Um, are mobilization costs generally 50% of the budget? Um, you know, that's, uh, it depends on the, you know, if you have a short squat building that, you know, goes on for 300 feet uh, the mobilization could be a lot. If you have a very tall, thin, narrow building with lots of setbacks, mobilization could be 50% 50, 50 is a high number. And the building has to have unique aspects to require that high mobilization. But we've been involved in some projects where, you know, the, the repair is relatively cheap compared to the amount of money that was necessary to access that area to repair it. Um, what kind of documentation from the eighth cycle work is needed to help with the ninth cycle requirement? Um, can you apply for exceptions? Um, well, if you did eighth cycle work, uh, I, I, I would assume you hired an architect or an engineer 
they prepared plans and specs, they did field reports, they had photographs, all of that information is the kind of documentation that you need to provide to the building department in, in, if you're asking not to, to be exempted from doing your uh, facade probes. Um, is the DOB allowing any additional grace period as a result of the COVID-19 situation or facade repairs that are maintenance related and are not a concern from a safety perspective? No. Is there a cavity wall case where the brick veneer is so poor it might be advantageous to remove and construct a new curtain wall? Uh, there are many buildings that are in poor condition. There are many cavity wall buildings that are in poor condition. Um, uh, in early in the mid 80s, the Vermeer on 7th Avenue and uh, 15th Street was the first building to reskin itself, a cavity wall building, because it was spending more money repairing itself. And finally, the building uh, decided uh, to bite the bullet and reskin itself. Um, over time, buildings get worse, not better, and it will become a planning, a management, a financial decision at some point whether a continuous repair program is cost effective or at some point, you know, do we just reskin the building um, with m new brick? Most of the time, in an apartment building situation, it doesn't pay to go from cavity wall to a glass building because of the detailing, the air conditioning sleeves, the existing windows. It, 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 it's just an exorbitant amount of money and it's actually cheaper to go back with um, more brick. Um, how long are the leak surveys good for before you require a retest? So, um, so we'll survey residents, you know, pretty, pretty close to the time of construction, or at least when we know that um, there is there, uh, an inspections taking place, there are defects that need to be addressed. Um, within that, uh, water testing might be needed. Um, and if we get to the water testing phase, we would strongly recommend that you make the repairs, you know, at, at that time, or very shortly thereafter, actually performing that. Uh, water test itself. Okay. Um, are there penalties if you've started but haven't completed by the deadline of cycle eight? Um, I believe if you started your work in your eighth cycle repairs, you could still file for extensions. Um, and uh, it's just the cost of the extension filing, which is uh, relatively minor. There are no penalties. The penalties start in the ninth cycle. Okay. Um, do NYCHA owned buildings above six floors have to carry cycle eight and nine inspections as well? Yes. Okay. Um, so I think that we are nearing the end of our presentation this evening. If anyone has any last minute questions, we welcome them. Um, and if we haven't answered anything specifically that you have thought of after the fact, um, you can definitely feel free to email um, all of my esteemed colleagues here tonight and we will um, ha be happy to circle back to you and offer some advice regarding this. All right. Yep, so if, if you have any questions about um, your project itself, whether it's strategy, uh, budget, um, even what type of building construction you are, you know, please reach out. Um, we're, we're, we're here and happy to help. All right, well, thank you so much, everyone. We really appreciate you for taking the time to join us this evening. Um, for more information regarding Local Law 11, please feel free to contact myself, Matt Resnick um, from ACAM, Howard Zimmerman. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We know you're a busy man and we really appreciate um, your time here with us um, and, and everyone else who joined us here this evening as well. Um, and again, we really appreciate you for being clients of ours and thank you for your time. Have a great evening. Bye. Thank you. Take care.